Today we're going to go through the circle of Willis, the blood vessels associated with that, the cranial nerves, and also the sinuses of the skull. Actually, let's begin with the sinuses first. I'm going to take this top and put this back on the skull like this. And you can appreciate that the very first thing here is the superior sagittal sinus. The superior sagittal sinus is where we find the, okay, the arachnoid granulations for returning cerebral spinal fluid to the venous system. So clearly this blue indicates that this is venous blood within the superior sagittal sinus. We turn the skull a little bit like this. We can see that the superior sagittal sinus empties into the transverse sinuses. So these are the transverse sinuses. And if we went straight back in, kind of where my probe is, straight back in, we would find something called the straight sinus. Let's open up the skull now. So in effect, the straight sinus would be right here, right, just sort of following my probe. That's where the straight sinus would be. All right, this is the transverse sinus. And you could appreciate that the transverse sinus will eventually become the sigmoid sinus. The sigmoid sinus makes kind of a lazy S traveling into the jugular foramen, uh, into essentially the jugular vein that's associated with it. Then right here is the superior petrosal sinus that also is going to drain into this sigmoid sinus. You can appreciate down below here is the occipital sinus. And I think that's pretty much it in terms of the sinuses that we can see in this particular region of the skull. But let's begin with the blood vessels that actually help to form the circle of Willis. And so we'll begin here with these two sort of blood vessels. These are arteries that form kind of an upside down V. And the V reminds us that these are referred to as the vertebral arteries, vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries join to form the bacillar artery. The bacillar artery is running right up the clivus. If you remember, that's the slope um, from the cella tersica on down to the big foramen magnum here. On the opposite side of the skull, though, would be the bacillar portion of the occipital bone. So bacillar, basically the bacillars go together, right? Bacillar artery, bacillar portion of the occipital bone. We come right up here, we see that this bacillar artery is going to split like this into the posterior cerebral arteries going to the back of the brain. And then coming off of them are the posterior communicating arteries. The posterior communicating arteries are going to be communicating with these arteries here, which are the internal carotid arteries. And I'm going to turn this uh, model over so that hopefully we'll be able to see them. So right in here, I don't know if we can get way down there or not. This is the internal carotid. First of all, this is the common carotid and the external carotid. This is the internal carotid, and you can appreciate it travels all the way down into that carotid canal, right? Now, it comes through the carotid canal and out here, which is crossing the foramen lacerum, not going through it, but going on top of it, and it will essentially form what looks like a bulge right here, which is, again, the internal carotid. For all intents and purposes, that internal carotid then becomes, in effect, the um, middle cerebral artery. So that's the middle cerebral artery here. And then branching off of this is the anterior cerebral artery. Connecting the two anterior cerebral arteries is the anterior communicating artery, this very small artery here. In reality, this is like a millimeter or two in size, so this is kind of exaggerated at this point. Okay, so the actual circle of Willis then includes the posterior cerebral arteries, the posterior communicating arteries, just a little bit of the internal carotid, a little bit of this middle cerebral artery, and of course a bit of the anterior cerebral artery as well as the anterior communicating artery. The whole structure again, the circle of Willis. All right, let's take a look at some of the cranial nerves. Um, I actually, for some reason, do not have cranial nerve number one on this model. That would be the olfactory nerve. I think that's probably on the brain model that comes with this. The olfactory nerve, remember, rests in the cribiform plates that are separated by the cristagalli, which is this structure right here. 
So this would be cranial nerve number one. Cranial nerve number two goes through the optic canal, and that of course is the optic nerve. Cranial nerve number three is the ocular motor nerve, and I think that this one is supposed to be cranial nerve number three right here, ocular motor. Cranial nerve number four is this little one. This is the trochlear nerve. Cranial nerve number five is the great big massive trigeminal nerve. You remember the trigeminal nerve has three branches. The first branch is the branch that travels through this structure right here, which is the uh, superior orbital fissure. And then the next branch travels through the foramen rotundum, that would be the maxillary branch. And then the third branch travels through the foramen ovale, that would be the mandibular branch. Cranial nerve number six is this little guy here. This is the abducens nerve. Okay, good. The abducens nerve, remember, regulates lateral movement of the eye. Now, cranial nerve number um, seven is the facial nerve. The facial nerve is traveling through the um, internal acoustic meatus, and it will travel out through the, uh, let's see if we can get that in there, yeah, this is the mastoid process, the styloid process, and so the foramen associated with this is of course the stylomastoid foramen. So exiting the stylomastoid foramen is the facial nerve, and you can appreciate some of the branches of the facial nerve here. Okay? Alright, so that's cranial nerve number seven. Cranial nerve number eight is this one here. Cranial nerve eight is uh, sometimes a double branch, sometimes the facial nerve is double, and more often the facial nerve is the double branch, but I have seen it occasionally where nerve number eight is the, face, is, the, uh, is the double branch. This is called the vestibular cochlear nerve, and it is traveling into the internal acoustic matus, and that's where it ends. Basically communicates with the cochlea in the inner ear. Okay, cranial nerve number nine is the glossal pharyngeal nerve. That's for gagging and gases. Number 10 is the vagus nerve, the wandering nerve. And number 11 is the accessory nerve, the nerve that innervates the muscles of the shoulder and the neck. Or some of the sh muscles of the shoulder and the neck, I should say. And notice that all three of these, 11, uh, I should say, well, 11, 10, and 9, all three of these go through the jugular foramen. The last nerve is number 12. This is the hypoglossal nerve. It thankfully goes through the hypoglossal canal. This is going to be innervating the muscles of the tongue. All right, so that's pretty much the features that we see on this particular model. And thank you very much.